Good morning. My name is uh, Alan Rowe. I'm a emeritus professor in the Department of Economics and former chairman of department. Well, my name is Mahmoud Mohideen. I'm currently the special envoy of the Secretary General of the UN on financing the Sustainable Development Goals. I uh, graduate of the Economics Department, Warwick University. I uh, got PhD uh, from Warwick in 1995 and just been honored again to get honorary degree uh, yesterday from Warwick. Mahmoud, it's a pleasure and an honor to welcome you back to Warwick to receive your honorary Doctor of Science yesterday. Thank you. What are your emotions on returning to this campus after more than 30 years? Well, I think uh, I had fun given uh, that uh, my family were with me uh, yesterday, my wife and daughter. It's always uh, great to uh, come back to Warwick. I did it uh, many times before. You remember, Alan, I did first my diploma here, and then I went for a year to do my master's at York University, and then came back to do uh, my PhD. And I kept visiting, not as frequently as I liked, but I kept uh, the, the links with Warwick. But yesterday was very much uh, with mixed feeling, humbling in a way, and then uh, reflecting, especially when uh, some introductory remarks about the justification of getting this honorary degree were uh, uh, mentioned. Um, so it uh, got me in a, a kind of a quick tour in, in history uh, for almost 30 years since yes. I left Warwick. Yeah. Your PhD topic was on financial liberalization policies in developing countries. That was a hot topic in many, many lower income countries at that period. But what was it that motivated you to choose such a topic when you were sitting here in Warwick? It took me a while to uh, to pick the topic, mm. and I wanted to get something that has three aspects to it. One, it should have some sort of uh, good theoretical foundations and good analytics. Otherwise, Warwick would not really allow me to get the PhD. Mm. The second one, I wanted to pick a topic of relevance to uh, policymaking at the time in Egypt and the developing economies and issues related to economic liberalization at large and uh, mm -hmm. financial liberalization in particular were of great relevance at the time, very um, controversial yeah. then, and I would say even now. Sure. And then the other part of it is basically the applied part. And uh, I remember it was not just applied on the macro side, on the financial liberalization, but I had uh, some uh, a good deep dive in, uh, in the financial sector. Mm -hmm. And then I went even further to uh, check the behavior of the household sector in Egypt in four villages from my neighborhood and how they react to these kind of big macro news yeah. on financial liberalization on their own consumption and savings behavior. And then uh, when you left Warwick, you went initially to be uh, an academic at the University of Cairo. Yeah. But you transitioned quite quickly from that to take on several roles in the government of Egypt in uh, macro management, debt management, and several other issues. Did you envisage that career progression from academia to policy making at the beginning, or was that something that just happened serendipity? Not in policy making, but in politics, because from some family tradition, village tradition, that politics had been always a big thing in our lives for many generations. So I thought that at some stage I have to go and fight for a seat in the, in the parliament, as my father did and a few of my uncles and even my great grandfather did. But uh, what I did in Egypt, I returned in 1995. I always kept my academic affiliation and I was promoted to a full professor in economics. Even when I was a minister, a few years after that, I kept my uh, my teaching habits. Yes. Uh, remembering going on every Saturday from six to nine to teach money banking and financial markets. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did that for the whole period for uh, 15 years. And I think it benefited me a great deal. I, I hope that I benefited the students at the same time. But sure uh, I kept that kind of portfolio between government work, advisory work, yeah. and the academic work. Because the next career move was, in fact, as you've already mentioned, you became in 2004 the minister, the first, I think, minister of investment in Egypt. Yeah. And this was a daunting job. I'm not, not sure how you managed to combine that with your Saturday teaching, but uh, you had to deal with both the difficulties in the financial system, but also, as I understand it, the uh, numerous difficulties in the Egyptian state enterprises. Uh, yeah. So could you just give us a glimpse, a short glimpse of how you responded to those very, that, very difficult challenges? It, it was a first of a kind kind of ministry because it was three uh, in one. It was uh, a ministry responsible for all functions of ministries of economy, 
and the Ministry of Public Enterprise, in addition to financial services. Yeah. And if there was any daunting task uh, of all of that, it was basically about uh, the public enterprise management and privatization. Yeah. Thankless job. Even if, you're, if, even if you're doing a good job, mm. you, nobody would thank no. you for it. But you have to do it because it's essential. I did that for uh, almost seven years. And I, I was happy because despite the criticism, the tough times, the impact now is being felt. And I'm happy that after many years, after I left government, people still uh, refer to these years as the legacy years of investment. Yes, yes. I have a record on attracting FDI in net yes. terms, not just by Egyptian standards, by emerging market standards, to be more than 9% of GDP. Uh, this is a record that I always tease my successors. If they can beat that, that would be great. Uh, and it was not all privatization. It was a mix of privatization and green uh, greenfield uh, investments. I introduced as well for the first time uh, major developments in the financial markets, including uh, mortgage market, uh, leasing activities, inspired by some um, programs of reforms. As far as from Australia, uh, you may remember, Alan, the uh, Wallace report on the financial sector reforms after a few crises facing Australia. That was basic about the discipline between the effectiveness of regulations and the efficiency of markets. Yes. So I did something similar to what the Australians did and in, in this country here in the UK as well did when they unified the financial regulatory agencies, not all of them, but only the non-bank financial yes. sectors. Yeah. So in every aspect of the three functions of the portfolio, on public enterprise, investment, and financial services, I'm happy that I left uh, not just a memory, but some sort of an institutional reform that was still yeah. remaining. And certainly what I've read in the press is that that success was clearly recognized by many commentators. One, one cheeky question now. I mean, you've moved on to become an executive director at the International Monetary Fund, and I couldn't help noting that Egypt's current extended fund facility with the IMF includes some very specific conditionality for further reform of the um, state enterprises, yeah. state-owned enterprises. Uh, mm -hmm. Is this a manifestation of the uh, somewhat older Mahmoud Bolhuddin using the punching power of the IMF to do something that he didn't quite manage to do back in the early 2000s? Not was at that... all. I think uh, the IMF staff had been inspired by their own uh, ways, <laughs> not through me. Uh, my current function now as an executive director is to uh, defend the interests of the 12 countries I'm representing, including Egypt. And as you rightly mentioned, the latest program has this issue related to public enterprise and state-owned institutions reforms. The, the job was never finished on the public uh, sector reforms. And uh, there are many state-owned enterprises that have been created as well after the 2011 uh, revolution. Yes. And um, I may come with more pragmatic approach than the uh, IMF and uh, to a great extent the World Bank insisting on uh, privatization of the assets as the only way uh, dealing with the matter. I would say, well, uh, this one of many ways. Privatization of management was successful, including during my time as well. You can keep the asset, but you, you get sophisticated, uh, articulate managers yes. from the private sector yes. to do what you cannot do as, as a government. And the other thing is leveling the playing field between the public enterprises and the, and the private sector. And actually, I have a full chapter in a book that I told you about. I hope it will be issued soon um, in September on the political economy of crisis management in Egypt, which tackles this very question, mm -hmm. what to do with the, uh, the legacy of the public enterprise, the negative side of it. Yes. And there could be as well some positive consideration for some social functions that should really be left not to the enterprises to do, but for the state and the budget of the state to do that. Yes, mm -hmm. understood yeah. that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, as a side, I think you might find yourself in high demand in the UK as we, we go through some uh, significant <laughs> changes in our own attitude to Happy to help give back. <laughs> yes, there's a lot of work we have to do in this country. <laughs> but then just moving on a little bit, after some eight years as a uh, minister in the Mubarak uh, government, uh, yep. with, as you say, a very impressive record of establishing new institutions. You didn't mention the Nalux uh, Stock Exchange, yes. the, the local institute of directors, an Arabic code mm -hmm. for um, corporate governance, to name just a few. You took up a, a new challenge, namely managing director at the World Bank in Washington, D.C., as part of your portfolio there, you were charged with helping to promote Millennium Development Goals, but then later to develop and promote the Sustainable Development Goals, which is currently the targets for international poverty and, and relief. And that's continued to be central to your work, as I understand it. 
Was there a single factor that motivated your move from the national stage to this important international stage? Well, the interest in the topic started even before joining the uh, the World Bank, the Millennium Development Goals, fighting poverty. Mm-hmm. And you remember during the MDGs or the Millennium Development Goals, uh, the target was very much modest, only halving the number of those who are suffering from extreme poverty. Yes. Uh, I don't believe very much in accidents of history, but uh, this is exactly what happened back in 2004 when I was invited by the uh, Chinese government to mention how influential the MDGs were in their policy. And they were taking them as critical minimum for their reforms, not the ultimate target, but basically to take it as a critical minimum. I say, well, given that China had the biggest number of those who have been suffering from extreme poverty, along with India, and both countries did very well from 2000 to 2015. I say, well, this could be something that we can really benefit from these big countries. And incidentally, actually, I don't know if you have seen the news. Back in 2020, China declared victory over extreme poverty, zero extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. And this is something that's not just good for developing economies to learn from, but perhaps some of the major OECD countries as well that had a significant number of people suffering from extreme poverty. And India, just a few months before the recent election, the prime minister announced ending extreme poverty based on the targets of the UN. So I'm mentioning extreme poverty, while there are many others. In the MDGs, there were seven other goals. In the SDGs, there are 16 other goals. But I would say for developing economies, that could be really a first target. And by doing that carefully, you would be helping other segments of the society. Because poverty is not about handouts. It's about decent education, investment in health systems investment in infrastructure, digital transformation, decent jobs, decent jobs, and investments as well in resilience yeah. and climate. Yeah. So when, when you do all of these investments, the poor would be the beneficiaries and they will help others when they uh, lift them out from poverty. Yeah. But meanwhile, you are helping a lot of opportunities for jobs, for uh, school teachers, for nurses, for medical doctors, for yeah. engineers, and for the rest of all disciplines that you would like really a society to develop into. So you found through this thought process um, a strong motivation to engage with this uh, on a more um, international stage, which was the opportunity you had in in the initially in the world bank as managing director and then then later when you moved to the un work with the secretary general um even more so i suppose as the special envoy on yeah the i i well. think i i braised the idea beyond the, the call of the a bureaucratic job in an international institution because um as an md i was responsible for uh, looking after all of these uh, big networks, and each one of them had uh, great leaders, uh, formidable VPs. I remember many of them mm-hmm. uh, with their great work, either the head of uh, Sustainable Development uh, Network, um, Rachel Kite, and those who are leading human development, or those who are leading private sector development, or uh, more on the private work engagements, or PREM, the Poverty Reduction and Economic Management. Mm-hmm. But uh, I was the coordinator of the work, yes. and uh, I was the interlocutor of their work uh, with other institutions, including the UN, IMF, and uh, G20. And yeah. then when I left the bank after 10 years of service, it was, I think, a good thing to move to the UN, and I was happy that I was called by the Secretary General yes. to help him. And you're sustaining that position now. I know yes. you're retiring as an executive director of the IMF yeah. in November, but the position with the uh, Secretary General will continue. Yeah, by November and, uh, I would have served already two terms, Yes, and I see that uh, this is enough of, of good service to the IMF, and that I'm happy to continue doing uh, the public service. But uh, as you uh, know better than I, I mean, as you say, there's been tremendous progress in China, 500 million people taken out of extreme poverty, and yeah. India is following suit, but we're now moving the poverty problem big time to Africa, and... Yeah. Uh, I mean, some of the forecasts I've seen suggest that, you know, in 20 years, 30 years time, 90 percent of the extreme poor will be on the African continent, which will, of course, as a population which is growing rapidly, be a, an extreme, extremely large continent in terms of population compared with what it is today. So there's a lot of work still to be done. Absolutely. Unfortunately, the last uh, few years were not really uh, very supportive to any serious work on investments in SDGs because of the variety of, of shocks. Mm. Uh, from COVID to the impact of tensions and the geopolitics Mm -hmm. and wars. But I would say that there were some issues as well to the um, uh, management of the economies. 
policymakers in many countries tend to blame poor performance on uh, external shocks or sure. what I call external hangers sure. of uh, their own making. But I would say that there is a great deal of opportunities for the 50 plus countries of Africa. Mm -hmm. There is a great deal of discrepancy. Some countries are doing very well despite all of these challenges. Some countries are suffering because of heavy dependency on the rest of the world. Yeah. But some serious consideration for the call of the Secretary General and call of many other leaders, including the Pope of the uh, Vatican, on the issues related to uh, debt and providing support on finance and technical assistance and providing as well some uh, good opportunities for knowledge transfer. That could really be very much uh, uh, helpful to accelerate the pace towards achieving yes, the SDGs. Indeed. And are you hopeful, as you, I'm not saying you're at the end of your career, but you're getting a little bit towards the latter part of your career, that the, these institutions you've worked for in such senior positions like the World Bank and the, and the United Nations have, have the teeth, have the um, ammunition, if you like, to address these problems which are becoming, from my vantage point, become actually even more difficult than was the case perhaps 10 or 12 years ago. Have they got the influence and the ammunition the teeth to, to really go for these problems when you're whoever takes over for you in some years time from the secretary general is, is it going to be a well, harder I, task for them yeah i think i think your question alan is the the, the permanent uh, question uh, that's being raised about uh, the, the in, these multilateral institutions to be fit per, for purpose or not mm -hmm. and the good thing is that there is a kind of a of a good attempt to answer your question on the summit of the future, which will take place in September, mm -hmm. it has some sort of good proposals on how to reform the multilateral system, make it more uh, relevant, more uh, effective. And we know very well that uh, these institutions, which were created after the uh, Second World War or operationalized after the Second World War, because the thinking about it happened toward the final years of the war, including the Bretton Woods Institution, the idea of establishing a successor to uh, the arrangement that we had of the uh, League of Nations to have the United Nations. The, these institutions celebrating this year and next year, 80 years of existence, yes. they need yes. really to uh, match the pace of change in the yes. world. Yes. When they were created, the majority of developing economies and emerging markets were not relevant as they are today to the world economy. Sure. Many of them didn't have sure. even a voice sure. uh, because they were occupied or under some sort of uh, yeah. a mandate. Yeah. So I think reforming these multilateral institutions will make them more effective. Um, otherwise, we'd, we would really see what we don't like to see, a more polarized kind of world. Mm. And when we have seen these, the kind of polarization in the past, that didn't really end necessarily in peace. I hate to say that in a kind of uh, not bringing good news toward the end of our discussion, but I would say, well, there is always a good alternative to tension, to, to wars and struggle, which is basically about uh, what can we do better in order to keep the peace and make everybody sharing the prosperity from that. Yes. Without multilateral system, facing these kind of global problems from yeah. poverty to climate to, to debt to issues that we have seen, diseases, yeah. communicable mm -hmm. diseases, yeah. um, that cannot really be done in an effort of one country, even if it, uh, it assumes that it has the power. Let's say that's qualified optimism with a degree of pessimism attached. Yeah, yes. um, <laughs> as, as one economist should do. <laughs> <laughs> one other area which is important in Mahmoud's uh, career, which is your appointment um, to be the high-level climate champion yep. for the COP meetings in uh, Sharm el-Sheikh in uh, 2022, Two. Two, yep. which brought you together with your long-term interest in sustainability in general, but into the climate debate big time. Yeah. I just I think that the the Sharm El Sheikh meetings and the subsequent meeting in UAE delivered some positive results. But how how do you assess things now? Each and any country hosted a COP. After the end of the COP, you will see the officials and those who are responsible for managing it saying it was a successful COP one way or another. And I I think yeah because people put a lot of effort in the organization and the arrangements and bringing uh, tens of thousands of people to one place for two weeks and and before that they work hard for for a year to prepare another year to follow up. Yep. So um, yeah, it's fair to say well uh, one is sympathetic, but not all COPs 
did end end well as as planned. And some of them are famous for good uh, success, like Paris uh, delivering the Paris Agreement or yeah. Kyoto with its protocol. I would say if Sharm el-Sheikh is, is going to be remembered of anything, I would say three. One is to um, relax that unnecessary tension between the climate club and the development club. For developing economies and emerging markets, if they do not really embrace the idea that climate action is part of their development action and policies, yeah. they would be losing a lot. When you do decarbonization, availing energy to those who don't have it, uh, getting seriously in areas related to uh, adaptation, it's very much areas related to development. Sure. And that gets me to the second point of the deliverables. Uh, I would say that before Sharm el-Sheikh, matters related to climate adaptation were very much vague or opaque. Mm -hmm. uh, Sharm el-Sheikh spelled out opportunities for partnerships between public and private sector yeah. to deliver on areas related to water management, food systems, agriculture, yeah. protection of the land, desertification issues, and uh, deforestation. And the third thing, I, I think for the first time that was built on nicely after that by uh, COP in Dubai that I participated yes, in and yeah. supported, is areas related to finance and investment. At, um, actually, we tackled this issue on finance, and I remember that was frequently quoted when I assessed finance for climate, similar to development, as being insufficient, inefficient, and unfair. Mm -hmm. Because there are gaps of finance, and uh, the process to obtain funding takes forever um, from some institutions. And in many cases, it's unfair because in, um, countries may need to borrow to fix problems that they were not responsible for creating, sure. including in adaptation. So I, I think of those three dimensions, yeah. Sharm el-Sheikh is remembered, and then it's an issue of cumulative process. I was quite alarmed when I saw the, um, uh, the huge numbers that came out of this high-level group that looked at finance, I think, at the Sharm el-Sheikh meetings. Yeah because we, we were familiar for a long time with the commitment of 100 billion, which was made, I think, in 2019. And independent assessments of that have been that it's it was not met and it was not being met by 2024. And yet the numbers that came out from this later COP meetings were trillions, yeah. much, much higher than this. Yeah. And the alarm that uh, that fed into my mind was, well, look, you know, I've worked for a long time on development. You've worked for a long time in development. And we, 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 we know the wide range of things that uh, the multinational financial institutions need to do. They need money for this. We don't want that all to be taken away with the, the name climate finance put on it instead, because that would damage a lot of the things that uh, you have worked hard for uh, over your career. Is that is that a danger? It's a danger. And uh, what it got me to, to respect numbers. And uh, and here in this area, <laughs> in particular, numbers are not very helpful because you you mentioned one report, uh, that report is telling us that for the SDGs at large, we need $5.4 trillion per annum for developing economies and emerging markets, mm -hmm. excluding China, sure. of which $2.4 trillion are needed for uh, climate action alone. Yes. $1 trillion should be mobilized externally and 1.4 through domestic resource mobilization. And that needs to be done every and each year from now until with, 2030. With half half of the money from the external yeah. sector, that's half a trillion a year, uh, should come from the private sector, 500 billion, yeah. doubling bilateral finance and tripling finance from the MDBs oh, sure. in order to deal with the gaps. And then the, even with the issue of the domestic resource mobilization, that requires a great deal of prioritization and heavy lifting on budget that are already constrained. Okay. So, yes, I think we, we managed to have a better understanding of the gaps. And with, in the future, I hope to have more of a bottom-up approach because the discrepancy between the different reports are because of issues related to, not just to different methodologies, but because of issues related to aggregation as well. Yeah. Because we don't, not every country we know very clearly what are the gaps are. Yeah. But good experience from some countries that I've seen in Latin America and some Asian economies and few of the African countries, better design of policies and institutions and better mobilization of domestic resources first can really attract the private sector and external support. Yes. The assumption that uh, the solutions will come with the generosity of the multilateral system or some benign uh, help from some particular capitals, that is not really going to uh, do the trick. Mm. It's all about how can we start reforms at home and then make the opportunities for climate investable opportunities. And then we'll be left with the adaptation part because that is still more of a public domain because the public benefit 
exceeds by far the commercial right. gain. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have a list of other things that you've talked about as global challenges, but I think we're probably out of time. Uh, Mahmoud, uh, thank you very much for your time today. Thank you. More generally for your personal dedication and extremely valuable contributions over many years to so many crucial policy areas. Uh, Warwick is very proud to have you as one of its former students. Thank you students, so much. And um, we will long remember you. Thank you very much thank indeed you so for much. your time.